I'm Christopher Donahue. I'm the historian of the National Human Genome Research Institute. It's my honor and pleasure to open this conference focused on the work of David DePew in the spirit of engagement, extension, and critique. David did his graduate work at the University of Chicago, the New School for Social Research, and the University of California at San Diego, where he received his PhD. Since uh, 2011, he is Professor Emeritus of Communication Studies in the Project on Rhetorical Inquiry at the University of Iowa. David with John Jackson also presented as part of our History of Genomics program in 2019. Of David's many, many publications, ranging from the complexities of Aristotle's contribution to, contribution to the life sciences, to the richness and challenges to the evolutionary synthesis, to the political ramifications of modern day and ancient biology, the contiguity of this work emphasizes that uh, problems, questions, and quandaries in the history and philosophy of biology are neither understood well articulated without historical context, nor is historical context free to do its work without the precision of philosophy. Returning to themes two in David's work, there is a consistent drive to understand complexities and unsolved riddles, even in the most well-treaded accounts, be it in Darwin or Dobzhansky. David is rightly adamant, too, that contemporary philosophy of biology is in danger of losing its philosophical technology if it is neglectful of the conceptual richness and difficulty of prior history. Today, we have six talks, which will not only engage with David's work, but, but which will draw upon larger themes and questions of this oeuvre. It is hoped, therefore, that today's meeting can be a, a way of engaging not only with the history and philosophy of biology, but with the history of that discipline itself to an engagement with a truly important figure, David DePew, within that discipline, thus serving uh, for a, as a model for how the discipline moves into another critical reflective period. And with that, David, over to you. I'm David DePew. I want to thank all of the speakers in advance for agreeing uh, to use my work as a at the intersection of history, philosophy, and rhetoric of biology as a framework for our discussion. I'm also grateful to Christopher Donahue and his colleagues at NHGRI for organizing um, and, uh, this conference and for um, his generous introduction, overly generous. Uh, it's wonderful to see old and new friends here today. Your work, some of which has gone into my own, could just as well have been used as a scaffolding for raising important questions at the junction between evolutionary biology, technology, biotechnology, and public policy. So our conference is a collective enterprise. I know that my own errors um, invite correction, supplementation, and refutation, and I'm eager to hear what you have to say. The context in which we are meeting presents very weighty issues. There is, for one thing, a growing existential realization that climate change is upon us and that its effects are exponential, exponential and irreversible. For another, breakthroughs in bioengineering, such as CRISPR technology, are occurring just as developmental biology, ecology, and cognitive science are giving rise to a more complex picture of how organisms, of what organisms are, and of how evolution works than we have been accustomed to relying on. This conjunction of new ways of intervening with new ways of representing gives fresh urgency to the geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky's famous remark that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Finally, these challenges are taking place against the background of a political crisis in which the authority of science has been eroded, just as when we need it more than ever. The authority of science and more generally sound norms and practices for establishing and interpreting facts was crucial to the formation and functioning of post-war democracies. The National Institutes of Health are a good example. Where would we be with COVID-19 without knowing what went into mRNA vaccines. 
And how could we learn about the ways of mRNA if we hadn't come to see how bacteria evolve defenses against viruses? George Santayana, I think, was not quite right to say that those who don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. Even in scientific matters, we usually come equipped with accounts of the past. Science educators um, have shown that uh, even school children uh, come to the scene of inquiry with pre-existing proto-theories inside of their heads that uh, need correction and that uh, gentle correction by exposing them and opening up their curiosity by exposing them to facts rather than pouring facts into what is often conceived as empty vessels, which they are not. The same, we're all in the same position, grown up or not. Uh, the trouble is that received historical commonplaces are often very poor guides to public policy. For example, understandings of Darwinism that were misunderstandings even when they first began circulating imprinted themselves on our society a long time ago. Even in the face of a century of steadily more powerful evolutionary science, and I might add a golden age of the history of science, these old pictures of nature and society, red in tooth and claw, have been very hard to dislodge. In this discursive condition, how can we expect science communication to succeed responsibly in uh, framing issues about how to apply new genetic technologies, some of which affect the germline. This is a definite challenge. My view, and I believe the tacit uh, view of our conference, is that we must revisit the history of biology in ways vivid enough uh, to unearth and upend inadequate accounts of it, some of which I confess have lurked in the corners of my own mind even when I didn't suspect it. It is in this spirit, I think, or something close to it, that we will reframe topics as obscure as Aristotle's biology and political theory, or as old fashioned as 18th and 19th century arguments about mechanistic materialism versus vitalism, or as relevant today as the mid 20th century population genetics that did so much to undermine the presumed biological bases of racism. Or the cru crucial development of molecular genetics whose spectacular success has undermined the pictures of evolution it started with. We can move more sure footedly into the future if we undertake this kind of an inquiry. And I, for one, am here to help us uh, do it and to listen to how other people are addressing the issue. Thank you very much. I'm very much looking forward to this. So with this introduction in mind, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to field any questions from first our speakers. And I want to particularly open with the idea that in order to address biological complexity, uh, and our changing understandings of the fundamental concepts of biology and genetics, we really have to address in a much more complicated, nuanced way, even foundational, fundamental discussions in the history and philosophy of biology. So any questions from the panelists first? And Chris, you're going to discuss a little bit the uh, Q&A feature for our I audience. Am Yes. Hi, I'm Chris Wetterstrand, part of the NHGRI History of Genomics program, and I was just going to make logistical notes that we will be taking questions through the Q and answer, um, uh, the Q and A box part of, of Zoom, um, and not the chat function. So folks should um, put their questions in there, and then the moderators will pick them up um, to be asked of the panelists. Um, we will, of course, use the chat function to chat and. Um, um, things like that, but put your questions in terms of the presentations in the Q&A box. Thanks. So any opening questions or comments first from our speakers? I'd very much like to hear what other people uh, thought of the way that Chris and I framed this. So Phil first. Yes, I'll make an initial comment. I thought, first of all, that was a very interesting framing of the uh, 
questions. And I think uh, one of the interesting points, and of course it's very much evident in your own work, David, is that to re uh, readdress and uh, deal with uh, many of these contemporary questions we're dealing with uh, in the uh, both uh, the ethics of biology, the use of technology and so forth, the questions of how we got here historically can be very uh, interesting to, to, to deal with. I mean, it's, it's a kind of history that helps us illuminate the present and why we're in certain kind of quandaries over either very highly theoretical issues like what is the species or some very technical questions like what is life uh, and philosophical questions. So I think your work has, has uh, opened up that very well. And I think your way in which you've gone about reflection, but I wonder if you had any further comments on that point, David. Uh, no, but that's, that's exactly what I was trying to get at. Um, but I should also say that the, uh, the wide scope of this kind of inquiry and how this history is sentiment, sen sedimented inside of our thinking, un well, even below our thinking level, is I, actually, I want to give a shout out to Marjorie Green, who had exactly, who was my mentor, and maybe, and others of you too, who had exactly that wide scope. And, uh, 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 I, and, and I think she was a model for me uh, on, of that. So I... I want to make sure that we all remember her while we while we do this. So Charles, you had your hand up. Yeah, and I'm nodding at what David just said because I was going to mention Marjorie Green, in fact, which was well, I was going to say something like there's an obvious dimension which I suppose brings us all together, some of us more than others, which I think David alluded to, which is a kind of um, uh, Gaillon, Depew, Sloan historicity, you know, richness of engaging with the history kind of perspective. But that's, that's like the obvious point. I was going to say something slightly different, and I was thinking of Marjorie Green in doing so, which is there's a funny tension, I think, and my talk doesn't address this, and I think David's opening remarks in a way did address it. It's a funny tension between the interest some of us have in studying sort of like reductionist and non-reductionist projects, you know, sort of holisms and organicisms and vitalisms versus other projects and how those those kinds of dichotomies or overlapping hybrid programs work. There's a funny tension between that kind of interest and the more rationalist interest in, you know, where would we be if science and policy hadn't done X, Y, and Z? And it's not that they're contradictory, it's that they tend to be narratives that go sort of on parallel tracks. They don't often touch. And I think Marjorie Green is probably one of the very few people ever who, who really had, um, what's the metaphor, you know, who was sitting in both chairs, who had her feet in both, both those worlds. And I think her relation to Darwinism sort of says it in one, in one sentence, you know, the relation to the more, science-friendly, mainstream, analytic, often reductionist-friendly way of approaching Darwin and her quote-unquote Germanic philosophical work. I mean, not just her heritage, but that kind of Goldsteinian philosophical anthropology type work. There, that's, that was my way of bringing Marjorie Green in too, but thanks. So I see several questions uh, in the chat box. Yeah, one question would be, uh, David, what specifically did you mean with the, uh, when you said the success of molecular genetics has undermined uh, the, the picture of evolution that they themselves started with? Could you elaborate a bit more, give us some more details on, on that topic specifically? Yeah. Um, 
I, I think in general, um, you have to re always remember that molecular genetics came out of an entirely different intellectual tradition from the natural historical uh, tradition of, um, of evolutionary biology. And um, you can watch the intersection of them in the early 50s with great interest. And in the general idea was, wow, this is wonderful. We finally found the source of the variation. Um, and then some worries begin to creep in about whether or not this entails some kind of genetic reductionism. Um, 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 and uh, those worries have been with us ever since. And um, uh, the, the proof in the pudding would be uh, what would happen when you had a real genetic revolution that would actually uh, affect the gene line, uh, the germ line without um, uh, un undergoing all of the um, um, eugenic side of uh, eugenic effects that were originally um, in the 20s associated with it. Well, we're there now. We're getting on the edge of that. And um, uh, so at the same time, uh, so you have this um, roughly reductionist determinist view in molecular genetics um, that went into the rhetoric, for instance, of the Human Genome Project in its early uh, quest for funding. Like, we're going to give you your genome, and then yeah, that's going to be a picture of you. And then if there's anything wrong, we'll fix it. Um, I was very successful in raising money, <laughs> um, um, especially after the uh, collapse of the, uh, of the super collider uh, at about the same time which would have cost a huge amount of money and which was eventually done in Europe uh, because you could say, genome project, this is great. In comparison, this is cheap. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, an amazing thing there. But what we've learned in evolutionary theory, especially through the integration of evolution and development is that uh, there are lots of the determinants of what happens that are epigenetic as it's now called as a kind of um, general term. Uh, and, and, and even the rise of possibilities of, um, uh, I wouldn't say direct um, influence of the environment on the germline itself, but pretty close to it, uh, and where the manipulability conditions are not particularly genes, but they are, uh, as Richard Lewinton was always insisting, they are environmental um, and require public policy that addresses those things. That's kind of what I had in mind. Does anybody else want to contribute to that? Well, I would also point out that the conditions behind the initial funding of the Human Genome Project were quite, quite, were quite complex, and there's a, a considerable amount of discussion around that. So I think you do highlight some of the rhetoric and uh, some of the initial aspects of it. But a lot of the uh, initial discussion was on development of uh, essential mapping and sequencing technologies without yes. necessarily over an Clinic. overarching conception of what precisely the HGP would produce other than uh, better ways of investigating the, found, the genetic foundations of health and disease. So I think there's a, my work in particular tries to complexify in, uh, in, uh, for, the, you know, for, for a wider audience some of the motivations and some of the contentions that went into the, the Human Genome Project as a, a, ver, uh, a, a very programmatic emphasis on, we would like to uh, uh, investigate certain problems in a better way. And we have tools and methods uh, that we think can become cheaper and more efficient. And that was a lot of, and, and thinking about in a particular way, some of the, the future applications that in many senses could help a lot of people um, with a fair uh, degree of modest investment. So I think for, for many people in the community, that was uh, a, a, a very specific way of thinking about the Human Genome Project in really pragmatic terms that really emphasized some uh, developing technologies, some really fascinating studies that were done in the mid to late 80s with the idea that this would actually uh, uh, help a great deal 
uh, a, a, a number of people uh, if uh, some of these some of these techniques uh, could be uh, uh, could be basically brought uh, into a more sort of scalable way. So that's that would be my one comment. So um, I, I take uh, that's why the writing the history of that period is so important. Precisely. So important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Multiple rhetorics, uh, but I think the pragmatic aspects mm. are really essential to keep in mind. So, Betty, you had a question as well or comment? I, I, I do. Um, and thank you, David, for remembering Marjorie Green. I, too, count her as part of um, sort of my, um, my, my mentoring um, in history and philosophy of science when she was at Cornell. Um, if I understand the frame and um, the opening frame, I would have to say um, that we need to know the history. Yeah, that's the kind of argument that I make to my dean, who is a chemist all the time. And of course, I believe it. I'm a historian. I'm not a philosopher. I'm a historian. Um, I believe that. On the other hand, it's not that simple. <laughs> because when you're dealing with the writing of history, you have got all kinds of complexities and different kinds of narratives are very often told that happen to be equally legitimate. It depends, the sources, who are you tracing? When it comes to something like the evolutionary synthesis, you know, I just, I marvel at the range of interpretations that still exist and the disputes that are out there. Um, when I look at, let's say, um, as, as I will discuss in my own presentation, when I look at advocates of the or proponents of the extended synthesis, I don't understand the history that they're telling. And I've been working in this area and I've lived the history of evolutionary biology. So I, I think we ought to be absolutely we need to know the history. But let's not presume that there is one well-defined history to be told. I see Phil is nodding. And, and to come to Philip Hannenberg's question, you know, I am experiencing a real challenge trying to, trying to come up with a kind of a middle ground where I support science in all of these recent attacks. But at the same time, you know, as a historian, I, I see complexity and we don't always have the time to be explaining all the complexities when you're dealing with different kinds of popular audiences. So Philip, I think that's a really good question and a challenge that he has posed. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree with that, Betty. I think one of the key tasks that we have as historians and philosophers is dealing with complexity, dealing with historical complexity, dealing with uh, philosophical conceptual complexity, communicating that complexity, uh, whether it be about population genetics, like the biology development of uh, sort of how science and technology interact, uh, is something as complicated as the origins and development of the Human Genome Project, um, in a way that audiences, uh, the general public, the informed public can understand. And I think at various times in the history of our profession, we uh, have done this better. And in some cases have, have there have been uh, sort of failings and false starts. And I think this is, you know, the, the real union between the history of science and the philosophy of science and science communication and science education uh, is something that I think is a continual issue and a continual, uh, and a continual dilemma because of precisely, uh, Betty, that reduction that you're, that you're considering. And I also think that um, it has to do with sometimes a static notion of what we believe the, the general public can understand, which I think is very much a dynamic thing. And I've always been of the opinion that the, the public and that's a difficult thing to define, can always understand more about the history of science and more about technical topics than, than can be given credit for in, in certain situations that in fact, the, the more complexity we're able to give our audiences in a reasonable framework, the better off we are, because that way we can set essentially a, uh, a standard, a basis, a foundation from which to, from which to 
develop a better understanding of key topics in the history and philosophy of biology. So Phil, you had, you had a comment or question? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that because I thought that was a very, Betty has raised a very interesting and important point. And I really actually want to refer it back also to a distinction that I, I, I got from something I wrote, read of David's, I can't cite the text. And I think the difference between a history, a really contextual history and what we might call genealogy. And, and, and I think that they have two different functions. Yep. Often yep. when we're speaking with, uh, uh, you know, trying to deal with contemporary problems like what should we do about CRISPR, we may be much more interested in the genealogy. In other words, trying to figure out, given a particular complex question we have, what are the things that have led us into that complex? That's a kind of teleological view. And that's, I think that's a very different thing than sort of bottom-up history that many of us deal with, which immerses us in enormous complexities of of different communities, uh, different texts and documents and so forth. So I do think those are somewhat different, uh, different uh, roles. And I think particularly for discussing a lot of questions of contemporary relevance, the, the, the question of genealogy can be more useful than I think sometimes the kind of deep contextual history that we might write. But David, I think you've talked about that. And I well, like actually to- the subtitle of Darwinism Evolving was um, a genealogy. I know well, that's right. That's natural right. selection, but I got criticized first night for too much history, not enough genealogy. <laughs> the people expected to be like Foucault, <laughs> which it isn't. <laughs> so we're skirting on the uh, edge between those things. But I think that's right. I mean, conditions of the possibility are what um, genealogies are, and they accumulate, and that's kind of my picture. But I don't think you can do it right without detailed history either. Oh, um, did I notice that uh, there's two more chat questions, one of them from Phil Hollenberger. Yeah, so we've, we've had... Um, uh, and one from Mahesh. No. Right, so I think we've addressed Phil's question a little bit, which is a much wider discussion. I think we have w- time for one more question before we move to... to uh, Philip's talk and then Matt's Q&A. Um, but I'm going to, actually, I'm just going to reference this. Um, what do David, well, what do the panelists think or what does David think in particular the, about sort of complex system dynamics and its relevance for the history and philosophy of biology for its rele- relevance for contemporary evolutionary theory? Um, I think this is an interesting question, a very broad question, but uh, something that we could probably address at least a little bit in, say, the next 90 seconds or so. Well, we have to keep it in mind because um, the picture of this genealogy that has been orienting what I've done since I worked with Bruce Weber uh, is that, you know, um, I followed Darwinism. Uh, went through a series of stages which have different conceptual foundations and that the general idea was that these stages depend on the kind of mathematics that you're using and that um, the statistical uh, turn really saved Darwinism from extinction pretty much. Uh, And then so now we have the system of complex system dynamics, which is actually going into the integration between development and evolution. And, uh, you, and, and, and ecology, especially ecology. And so I think we had to bear that in mind in the, in the conference that you're on the edge of, uh, whether you ought to think about the idea that uh, 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 once you have um, uh, uh, new mathematics, you get control of something that you otherwise, at first you thought was just irrational and you couldn't, you couldn't deal with it. And uh, you find ways of coping with it. And that's kind of the way I see um, complex system dynamic. I don't see it as a worldview so much as a set of tools. Yeah. So, yeah, and there's always been in the history of biology this, this relation of what is the relation of the part to the whole, and I also think that increasingly now that discussion is resolving itself in what is the sort of complex system debate right. versus sort of individuals to uh, to wider groups, wider communities, and the history of genetics and the history of social thought. Many, many disciplines have tried to define what is the relation between the, the individual and the group. 
on a lot of the 20th century is, is determined by various ways of answering this question. Yeah. So, but my, my uh, implication would be, and I think yours is too, that um, you might not, you, you probably have some new tools available now to sort of make another run at that question <laughs> of, of holism and uh, partism. Okay, so we are out of time and we have to move on to our first lecture from Philip Sloan. So thank you very much. Thank you for the questions from the audience. And um, we will return with a Q&A shortly after Philip's talk. Philip Sloan is Professor Emeritus in the Program of Global Studies and the Graduate Program in History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Notre Dame. Originally trained in biology and chemistry with a specialization in evolutionary biology in the deep sea, his professional career has been devoted to the history and philosophy of the life sciences with publications on the history of evolutionary theory, enlightenment natural history, and recent genetics and molecular biology. He is a fellow and past president of Section L of the AAAS and a fellow of the Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values at Notre Dame. Sloan's most recent books include Creating a Biophysics of Life, The Three-Man Paper and Early Molecular Biology, and he is the main editor and contributor to Darwin in the 21st Century. I'm honored to be asked to contribute to this symposium on the work of David DePue commenting on such a prodigious body of scholarship that he has produced makes it difficult to know where to begin. In selecting the topic of this paper, I've taken my point of departure two issues in his analysis of Darwinism. One is his interpretation of Darwin's project, in which Darwin is seen as having a genuine, indeed a burning desire to find a theory of organic origins that conformed as far as possible to Newtonian canons. The second is David DePue's analysis of the history of Darwinism as itself an evolving system of concepts that have changed over time in response to social and rhetorical and scientific communities that have surrounded its different formulations and that require discrimination. If we were to understand what Darwinism means in any given context, my focus in this paper is to look at some select elements in the development of Darwin's original theory that surround the attribution of Newtonian to his theoretical achievement. While I agree that there are aspects of David's, uh, Darwin's, uh, reading Darwin's work with which I agree, I also raise some cautions about this interpretation. Indeed, need for caution is also illustrated in some of David's more recent discussions of issues of teleology and final causation with respect to Darwin's theory that certainly amount to heresies in some circles. But these allow us to find openings to new interpretation of Darwinism in light of more recent concerns with organismic and developmental biology. My own specific interest is in seeing in the vital dimensions of Darwin's project, issues that bear on his discussions of consciousness and human and animal relations and on the inner dimensions of living beings. These themes explored in the last century in the writings of primarily German philosophers like Helmuth Plessler and Felix von Urkskull, Max Scheler and others, and in important ways imported into Anglophone discussions by David's collaborator, Marjorie Green, uh, have not been typically discussed in Anglophone circles. This has indicated for these philosophers, at least some of the problems in reading Darwinism as a solution to major questions of biology that reduce it to the application of paradigms of physics to the life sciences. The renewed interest in these German reflections is an ongoing project taking place at present under the leadership of Lenny Moss, with David DePew and others, including myself in this discussion. I will first highlight some issues surrounding the early origins of Darwin's theory that shared to shape his original formulation of transformism. That I, these are that I interpret as non-Newtonian origins of his theory. Secondly, I will then examine the origin, introduction of Newtonian dimensions into his work and the degree to which these warrant a Newtonian reading of his project. Finally, I will discuss some of the continuities of his reflections on mind and nature and the descent of man with the earlier non-Newtonian layers of his thinking. 
Now, to situate this discussion in a larger intellectual framework, I will claim without attempts at documentation in this short talk that the general absence of genuine transformist theories in the history of life until the late 18th and early 19th century was a direct consequence of mechanistic and inert theories of matter that reflected the dominance of Cartesian and at least some readings of Newtonian natural philosophy. The new transformisms of Herder, Lamarck, Schelling, and others uh, that could, could appeal to vital materialism or to the addition of special powers of matter or to appeals to dynamic Newtonian fluids to give its the system its developing dynamism as, as uh, Charles Wolfe has developed in the previous paper. Darwin, I will argue, built his initial theory on a similar foundation, but at a much more subtle level of argument. So for some preliminaries, what I would call the Beagle drop backdrop, I've, after, I've in other publications detailed some of the developments of Darwin's theory of life and matter during his Cambridge years of 1827 to 31. Cambridge was also the place of his initial encounters with the romantic philosophy of nature of Alexander von Humboldt. These foundations constituted an early framework upon which he explored some limited questions of the relation of matter and life that we can follow into his discussions in the Beagle years. What we find in Darwin's Beagle writings are not explicit theoretical discussions of vital powers or other obvious treatments of life matter question. Instead, what we do encounter are two levels of discussion. One can be seen in the more general Humboldtian reflections on the grandeur and luxuriance of the living world and the vitality of nature that Darwin describes vividly in his first reflections occasioned by his encounter with the Brazilian rainforest in 1832. Second and more limited discussion concerns his detailed examination on living planktonic and sessile invertebrates recorded in the zoology diary. In this record, Darwin seems fascinated with the observations of minute particles of granular matter that he claimed could be observed through the microscope in these live specimens of planktonic and sessile invertebrate animals. These granules, often termed gemules, that displayed motion and dynamism in live specimens. An example is an observation in early and late, uh, early 1835 on a Medusa. Darwin writes, as we read, during the dissection, I noticed that all the granular matter possessed a rapid revolutionary motion. The instant a mass of granular matter was broken, each little detached piece, detached piece, whatever shape began to revolve. There could be no mistake. The more minute particles revolve the quickest. This power lay chiefly, if not entirely, in the reddish granular matter. The field of view in the microscope appeared enchanted. When Darwin began his reflections on the species question in the spring of 1837 upon his return from his epic journey around the world, we see him speaking about atoms, monads, monocules, or gemules of life. The reference to these is now combined with the thesis concerning the relation of elementary particles of, of living matter to the degree of organization attained by an organism. We can see this ex uh, idea expressed in an undated passage added at some point to the inside cover of the so-called red or RN notebook that covers the latter portion of the Beagle voyage and his first reflections back in England of, uh, up to March of 1837. As he's added here, the living atoms have definite existence. Those that have undergone the greatest number of changes toward perfection, namely mammalia, must have a shorter duration than the more constant. This view supposes the simplest infusoria same since the commencement of the world. The theme of a quantitative law-governed relationship between living atoms and the degree of organization and the duration of species may be a key to an elusive dialogic aspect to these relations. Reflections. When Darwin had moved to London in March of 1837, he commenced regular meetings with his new acquaintance, the Hunterian Museum comparative anatomist Richard Owen, concerning the description and classification of the beagle mammalian fossils 
lodged at the Hunterian Museum. Remarkably, at this exact time, Owen was in the process of the final drafting out of his series of 24 biweekly Hunterian lectures that were to commence in the newly remodeled Hunterian Museum on May 2nd of 1837. Delivered to an audience of around 400 people that included the leading lights of London science, this was the opening show of the newly remodeled Hunterian Museum. Owen's lectures covered a wide range of topics that extended from a survey of the history of comparative anatomy to discussions of fossils and evidently even of Charles Darwin's fossil toxodon. Darwin's close uh, confidant, Charles Lyell, would attend at least some of these, as would the Oxford paleontologist, William Buckland. Although there's no evidence to confirm this, it'd be surprising if Darwin had also not attended. Whether or not that's true, Darwin accepted in the early part of the B notebook a law-like relationship between vitality and complexity of organization that initially limits the duration of species and individuals that is similar to an argument Owen was putting forth in his lectures. Darwin reflected on this issue in some crucial passages of the B notebook and in one dramatic passage we read, is this shortness of life of species in certain orders connected with gaps in a series of connection? If starting from the same epoch, certainly, the absolute end of a certain form uh, considering South America, independent of external ca causes. And then we read down at the bottom, if we suppose similarity of animals in one country owing to springing from one batch, and the monocule, now he's using this term, but the monocule has definite life, then all die at one, period. Which is not the case. Monocle, not definite life. In this, he broke with the limitations that, and the conclusion that there are no such limitations on lifespan and the potential for the development of species. It's at this point he then sketches out his famous diagram of the B notebook, of the tree of life that related groups together in historical genesis. Now in this brief sketch of the interplay of a, with a uh, of a kind of vital conception of matter and the original emergence of Darwin, the version of transformism. What I suggest is getting the theory of species transformism off the ground for him is a theory of biological matter possessed of vital powers that are unlimited by a law governed relationship between quantity of vitality and degree of organization. Now, this is something more subtle than we can see in the theoretical frameworks of previous versions of transformism. From this point, Darwin has entered new theoretical territory and commences an exploration of a theory of species transformism, unlimited by restrictions on the power of life to develop and complexify. It's in the succeeding C notebook, dated from May to June, uh, in, in, in entries dated from May, June of 1838, that we see a new dimension of this argument as it bears on issues of mental powers and consciousness. Here we encounter a dynamic matter-mind monism that shows the impact of the reading of German romantics. In this discussion that follow his reading of a treatise on the philosophy of nature by the German romantic Carl Gustav Carus, Darwin writes, there's one living spirit prevalent over this world. And I've highlighted here, there's one thinking, creative, sensible period, ultimately allied to one kind of organic matter brain which is modified into endless forms bearing a close degree to the endless forms of living beings. We see thus unity in thinking and acting principle in the various shades of separation between those individuals endowed and the community of mind. Okay, enter Newtonianism. But as we know, there's a profound change that subsequently occurs in the denote reflections that surround the rereading of Thomas Malthus' essay on population in September of 1838. These developments serve as the grounding for interpretations by Michael Roos, Sam Schwaber, David Hull, Jonathan Hodge, David DePew, and Bruce Weber, who've all developed in different ways the case for a strong Newtonian reading of Darwin's project, at least from this day forward. David DeFew, following the lead of uh, Sylvan Schwaber, has analyzed this in his Darwinism evolving as an incorporation of an analogical Newtonianism that was developed on the theories of political economies of Adam Smith, Thomas Malthus, and Ricardo. 
Even before the famous Malthus entries, we can see the language of physical science enter his discussions in an entry in August, likening the development of the natural world to, to the product of natural causes. What a magnificent view one can take of the world, astronomical unknown causes unknown, modified by unknowns, changes in geography, changes of climate, super added to change of climate from physical causes. These superinduced changes of form in the organic world as adaptation. These changings changing affect each other and their bodies by certain laws. And so it goes on instinct alter. Reason is formed in the world people with myriads of distinct forms. With the Malthus entries of uh, a month later, uh, we can, uh, we now encounter vivid imagery as we read here. Until one sentence of Malthus, no one perceived the great check amongst men. One may say there's a force like a hundred thousand wedges trying to force into every kind of adapted structure into the gaps in the economy of nature, or rather forming gaps by thrusting out weaker ones. The final cause of all this wedging must be to sort out proper structure and adapt it to change. To do that for form, small to show final effect. Dating from these entries, we see the emer emerge one prominent meaning of natural selection that will appear in the early draftings of the theory. One uh, denoting the action of a teleological final cause that will sort out proper structure and adapt it to change. In the succeeding e-note book uh, in October, Darwin will even speak for the first time of nature as this selector that picks out forms more easily than man. I can shut off screen read here. Darwin's theoretical development from this date displays a general cessation of inquiry into the ultimate causes of life, the nature of vitality, and any appeals to the action of dynamic matter as driving the evolutionary process. It would seem that matter has become once again passive and inert, as conceived in classic mechanistic Newtonianism, governed by natural laws, adapting in company with an external wise selector, organisms to their external conditions of life. It's at this point we might speak of Darwin as developing something analogous to a physicalist Newtonian conceptual framework, never explicitly named as such at this time, but in effect resembling several features that characterize Newton's physical dynamics. We have a dynamic system of bodies in motion driven by a kind of inertial force, that of geometrical population increase a model of force acting upon material bodies in lawful way. And where Newton makes any departure of a body from its inertial state of rectilinear motion due to the action of externally impressed force, Darwin makes the control and limitation of the force of population an external constraint that acts originally as an intentional power of selection, controlling numbers and resulting in a force-driven action of species against one another. And just as Newton declined to give a causal explanation of his principle of inertia, making it simply axiomatic as the first law of the Principia, Darwin gives no causal explanation of this new force of population that is driving the natural species into all available niches. The whole attention has shifted from internal dynamic powers to external controlling forces. This fairly dramatic shift of perspective that enters Darwin, the Darwin manuscripts with the Dean notebook sets up the discourse that we can trace through the 1842, 44, and 56 drafts. The force of population acts in company with selection by nature on slight variations to prove divergence from common ancestors leading to major change in species over time. This framework defines the public presentation of the theory in November of 59, 1859. But the insertion of his work conceived originally in the 1830s in the public world into the public world of the 1860s, or at least the professionalized discourse, scientific discourse, uh, at least was defined by physics of James Clerk Maxwell, Lord Kelvin, the comparative anatomy of Cuvier and Owen, the biophysics of Helmholtz and Dubois Raymond, the cell theory, experimental biology of Pasteur and Claude Bernard, meant that Darwin had to engage a sophisticated scientific level of discourse defined by the limited scientific papers and journals rather than by great syntheses. He also had to interface with contemporary discussions of methodology of science framed in the debates taking place among his contemporaries, John Herschel, John Stuart Mill, William Hewell. 
Darwin's interaction with the public and professional communities of the 1860s is a lesson in how different readings of Darwin could be given by different communities of discourse that David DePue has described in an important paper. The early reception by, of Darwin by much of the professional community has been analyzed in major studies of uh, the professional public reception by Albert Elligard, David Hull, John Guillaume, David DePue illustrates that he was not initially regarded at least by the professional community as having achieved some kind of Newtonian synthesis applicable to the biological world. Instead, troubling questions were raised about the satisfaction of methodological canons generally accepted by con contemporaries to be those governing genuine Newtonian science. His language suggesting the action of a wise teleologically selective agency of nature seemed to many as naively anthropomorphic. Coupled with the non-technical and semi-formal formal a popular form of presentation that was forced upon him by his rush into publication of the self-designated abstract after the letter of A.R. Wallace, the initial reception by many of the leading professionals of British science was in many cases openly hostile and not simply on ideological grounds. For such critics as William Hopkins, Owen, Sedgwick, Kuehl, and Herschel, Darwin's theories failed to satisfy canons of empirical testability and demonstrative proof that they viewed as the key requirements of Newton's scientific methodology. We can follow in Darwin's extensive correspondence, his efforts to clarify his meanings of key concepts, his valiant attempts to defend his methodology and the empirical warrant for his claims. His clarification of the third edition of the origin that nature was no more than an impersonally, mechanically acting force rather than a teleologically acting demiurge reconceptualize his concept of natural selection and its action. We can follow how Darwin sought to move its argument more into conformity with the language of physical science that now surrounded it. Darwin more explicitly identifies his theory as Newtonian enterprise, both in methodology and spirit specific workings, draws parallels to his account in Newton's even claiming that his principle of natural selection is a Newtonian vera causa. But the endless revisions of the text left many incoherencies and uh, inconsistencies standing. The most generous thing that his one-time friend and later bitter adversary, Richard Owen, could say about Darwin, was he was certainly, quote, the Copernicus of natural history, but not its Newton. Now, as the historical studies by Hull, Bowler, Guillaume, and Depew have shown, Darwin's stratagems were not generally successful before the 1930s, uh, with the scientific community generally, and have not been so in the public domain for various reasons to the present. The new synthesis and the rise of theoretical population genetics resolved the main points of dispute between natural selection theory and the new genetics. The retrospective reading of Darwin's theory by the architects of the new synthesis and by philosophers of biology who systematized and elaborated the theoretical structure of neo-Darwinism have now seen Darwin as of satisfying the basic canons of at least contemporary philosophy of science. And as David DePew and Bruce Weber illuminated in their influential discussion, the reconciliation with the background physical science was made possible by reinterpretation of Darwin in the language of statistical mechanics of Maxwell and Gibbs, rather than that of classical Newtonian materialism. We turn here to screen share. But well, we know that this is, but all is not well with the solutions of the new synthesis to several problems concerning the organic world. Before we go too far along the route of accepting Darwin as having answered Kant's doubts about the possibility of a Newton of the grass blade, there are those dimensions of his thought that reflect persistent conflict with issues that I argue reach back to an earlier layer of theorizing and that can there's some degree in play in the difficulties that have come to face the Darwin of the new synthesis. When Darwin turned in 1867 to write a short essay on the origin of mankind, eventually to blossom into the two-volume Descent of Man, he reached back into the reflections of the C notebook quoted previously and a theme more developed in reflections in the M and N notebooks on metaphysics and expression of the emotions that paralleled the composition of the C, D, and E transmutation notebooks. Here we can encounter again a kind of vital monism that comes more to the fore in the entries, especially in the M notebook. 
There we see Darwin frequently commenting on inner properties of animals, their continuity with those of human beings, even attributing free will to oysters, moral sense to animals, satire to dogs, and so on. As he says in this comment here from the M Notebook, with respect to free will, seeing a puppy playing cannot doubt they have free will. If so all animals, then an oyster has, an Apollo, and a plant in some senses. Now free will of organ, oyster can, one can fancy to be a direct effect of organization. This discourse appear, reappears in the descent in the strong parallelism of inner mental states with external anatomical complexity. Darwin does not, we see, reduce mind to matter in the tradition of German materialists of his day. Instead, what is developed is an intermediate reductionism. Higher mental properties of humans are interpreted as simply more elaborate manifestations of the same properties in other less complex but still vital organisms possessed of will, intentionality, and some kind of basic inwardness. The result is the pervasive anthropomorphism of Darwin's discussion of mental powers. Such powers are not, in the technical language of the comparative anatomy of his day, simply an analogical similarities. They are literal identities, true homologies. Human children may play together, but so do ants. Shame, imitation, magnanimity, sympathy, wonder are inherent properties designated by terms that can be applied univocally to the actions of humans and animals. What warrants these identities is not loose metaphor. Instead, we are drawn back more to the pantheistic nature of Carus and Humboldt of the early notebooks that manifest itself not so much in a vital materialism as in a dynamic matter-mind monism. Mindedness and inner intentionalities are pervasive throughout nature, extending from humans and primates down even to the sensitive plants, as he will express in his last works. What these differences between the world of the origin and that of the descent illustrate is the complexity of Darwin's thought about several issues. If the framework of physical science, causal law, and mechanical action seems to be that which emerges from the final two editions of the origin, giving us the physicalistic picture that will subsequently underlie developments that result in the new synthesis, the concepts manifest in the descent move us in a different direction and put Darwinism in con conversation with psychology, studies of animal and human behavior, and eventually engage fundamental epistemology. The expansions of the synthesis proposed in recent decades by Evo Devo theory, the new emphasis on niche construction as a causal agency in evolution and interactionist theories of species change that relate organism, genome, and environment, all seem predicated on some kind of fun word fundamental inwardness and dynamism of organisms, properties that do not easily fit with the physicalist Darwinism of the original new synthesis. Uh, in, and from my in conclusion, from, in focusing my talk on these issues, I produce, pursued topics not directly in David's focus, but I particularly absorbed from his paper on Darwinian historiography, his other writings, and his summary statement of his general research trajectory new ways of looking at these questions. David has been concerned in his recent statement to argue that Darwin quotes, broke through the design mechanism binary. This was a model we can see as part of what I've characterized as Darwin's Newtonian framework as originally stated, with some kind of external design acting in accord with natural laws and in an inner conception of matter to result in evolutionary adaptation. But how Darwin develops fully the alternative to that image is an issue I've sought to explore more deeply in this paper. By looking at the early origins of Darwin's theory and the continuity of aspects of these early roots of his original theory with Darwin's later work, I here see here some ways of dealing with issues raised in the expanded synthesis, which David is directly concerned to do. As David is clearly aware, dealing with the world of descent must concern at some point with the relation of knower and the known, and eventually with fundamental epistemology and even metaphysics, if we are to attain a philosophy of biology that really does justice to the phenomenology of the living world. Now, Darwin, to be sure, does not choose to go there. When Darwin on rare, rare occasions reflects on these issues in his well-known correspondence with William Graham late in life, he is simply troubled by the complexities of the questions his work ultimately raises on the philosophical level and sees even the possibility of an ultimate epistemological skepticism that could result from this theory. 
David's focus had not been on the world descent directly, but his analysis of Darwin analyses are directly on this in important ways. His recent work drawing out issues dealing with teleology and final causation in relation to Darwin's work, ingredients that our ingredients enable us to enter more deeply into the world of the descent. His examination of the way rhetoric is, situ is important for the scientific theorizing and its historical situatedness and the importance of this for interpreting the rhetoric of the descent all supply basis for this, uh, in these insights into Darwin. For this, I am deeply in his debt. And I want to thank you all, including the organizers of this continent, and in particular, David DePew. So now we will have Charles Wolf uh, lead the question and answer session. Charles, over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Phil, for a beautiful talk. I have some rough, rough and ready question or two questions squeezed into one, but I'm, I'm looking at the audience uh, in case, okay, if there isn't an immediate question for Phil, let me, let me um, come back to the issue concerning dynamic matter and Darwin in Phil's talk. You say the absence of genuine transformist theories of the history of life till the late 18th, early 19th centuries is a direct consequence of mechanistic and inert theories of matter that reflected the dominance of Cartesian and at least some readings of Newtonian natural philosophy. And so, and you said a few things about this. And that raises the question to me, A, to what extent can transformist theories be aligned with vitalist theories, given that vitalists, as well as the sui generis Claude Bernard, say next to nothing about evolution and those kinds of issues. It's as if they're parallel universes. And I'd like Phil, secondly, or point B, to clarify a bit the Newtonian point, because I think he's very subtly shifting the goalposts in the way that uh, Sam Schwaber and David DePew had so brilliantly dealt with Darwin as a Newtonian. I'd like Phil to be blunter in what he's doing in relation to that. Because when I hear Newtonian, I think of the Newtonian analogy in the life sciences in the 18th century, which is very fruitful in vitalism as well, and also in Haller and Blumenbach and so forth. Whereas in Phil's way of talking about it, Newtonian seems to mean a kind of closed perfect system, which raises the question then how can Darwin fit in that model? So there's a sort of analogical Newtonianism is a slightly different story, I would have thought. And lastly, the, the same question, third way of putting it, to what extent is dynamic matter, vital matter, ultimate cause of life talk, to what extent is that relevant for Darwin or not versus Lamarck? Because Phil quoted some notebooks where Darwin seems to care about that and he said, okay, he doesn't stick with it. But could he come back to, to that story? And those are my points. Thanks again, Phil. Well, uh... Let's see, I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, really glad to get the commentary from uh, Charles, who certainly has explored these questions uh, very deeply. Uh, in, in the statement I made, which I didn't really have time to document, in which I'm relating uh, transformism to, uh, to uh, various kinds of vitalism, I would argue that one of the things that is certainly holding, you might, if you, we can use that term, holding back any kind of transformist evolutionary view in terms of the, uh, 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 before the 19th century, is the fact that, that for so many of the uh, formulations, that's particularly in say the physical sciences descending, you might say from orthodox Cartesian, and at least one reading of Newton, matter is inert. You might have powers that act on matter, but nonetheless matter itself is inert. And I think you can see this even when we would get uh, 
to someone like uh, Buffon, who would, in some ways, seems to have a kind of dynamic theory of matter, and yet he has a degenerative view of the cosmos, gen degenerative view of nature. And I think it's really interesting to see when we go to, say, toward German philosophers like Herder, then we begin to see the introduction of vital force. We also get to see developmental views of nature uh, taking place. And, and I would, uh, if we had more time, I'd like to go, I would really be get, glad to go into this in terms of Blumenbach uh, and also Lamarck. Lamarck. Lamarck has these dynamic Newtonian fluids. I think you brought out very well that there's certainly other ways of reading Newton and a lot of the what you might call uh, the vitalists of the 18th century would consider themselves Newtonians in some respects. But one of the ways in which they aren't Newtonian, you might say, is that they don't accept a, a, a particular inert view of matter, which we might have a physical force acting on it and actually put powers into matter at that point here. Now on the question that, that, that of course, I'm really uh, taking on some issues that David and Sam Schwaber and others have made about uh, Darwin as Newtonian. I want to be clear about my argument uh, here is. What I want to argue is <clears throat> for a certainly early part, <clears throat> early part of his views, Darwin is cannot be put into some kind of Newtonian framework. And I think this would be true of the early uh, notebooks. Excuse me just a minute. In the early no, <clears throat> but I also would agree that there is this with the, the Malthus introduction, there is this introduction of physical metaphors. And what I've said is the, the, the shift from internal dynamics of life to external controls on an inertial principle of life. I think that's the point I want to bring out is that the principle of population is fundamentally an inertial principle for Darwin. Now, if you go back to the roots of the principle of population, Malthus, Malthus it, it attributes it to vital atoms of some kind, but Darwin doesn't use that kind of language. I think what that does is enable Darwin to certainly develop something much more like a Newtonian dynamic models of life. And what I want to certainly emphasize here is that, um, that I think Darwin, particularly as I've tried to detail, goes through the various revisions of the text and the debates and so forth. I think Darwin wants to push himself much more into the form of conforming to contemporary physical language. And he isn't really, you, you can't you see sort of disappearance of any kind of what seem to be ref references to vital atoms, vital matter, and so forth. But what I'm trying to then say is, look, when we go back to the descent, then we get back into another world and we're getting back to inwardness of life, getting back to dynamic powers of life. <clears throat> and I think that to me is in some ways the more interest, some interesting dimensions of, of Darwin's uh, view. So I think that I've tried to capture, the, you had some very good questions here and I certainly want to follow those up. Maybe there's some others that want to bring those there, in. There, there's a question. So thanks a lot, Phil. And I yeah, see to what know. I'm here. So um, there's Benjamin Feldman in the audience speaking of atoms and of vital matter. He says, he writes, I read that Darwin's grandfather Erasmus had some influence on his theory. Do you have any comments on this history? So there you go. Yes, yes, I didn't develop that point, but I think that can be very important. The first line of the B notebook is Zoonomia, which is the title of Erasmus Darwin's great work and which Erasmus himself is very much holds to theories of vital matter. I don't pick that up uh, in terms of the, you might say the more detailed workings of what some of the points I've tried to bring out in, in these passages in the B notebook. That, but I do think that Erasmus was certainly an important influence on him. He read him in Edinburgh and uh, he was part of the family tradition. And he's also, Darwin's made annotations on Erasmus Darwin's uh, Zoonomia. So there's definitely there, you know. Okay. Um, <coughs> let's see, there's any, <coughs> Betty? Bill, thank you. And um, it was a very beautiful talk. And um, I just, I, I marvel at this kind of close reading um, and intellectual history. And you are the master, I have to say. So thank you. Could I ask you, I'm not an 18th or a 19th century person, 
one of the things that intrigued me about this romanticism slash Newtonianist discussion, let's just say in, in understanding Darwin and his work was the feud between um, Bob Richards and Michael Roos. Could I, I mean, that's, everybody's laughing. I, I mean, I really tried to understand what was at the heart. I mean, you did a beautiful job of kind of mediating, but, but what's going on there? Why is there so much just emotion? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can comment on this. <clears throat> in most of those fights, Bob Richards and I have been more on the same side. We take slightly different readings of this. I think uh, what I've wanted to emphasize here is certainly that there's a subtle level of Darwin's argument that I tried to bring out about the relationship of the powers of life and degree of organization that somehow gets modified. And I think Owen is really more important for that view uh, and the dialogue with Owen than it would be with Humboldt. But I, th but I think particularly through uh, Darwin's reading of Humboldt, uh, his romantic uh, conceptions of nature, a lot of these uh, passages, even, the, even what you might call the matter-mind monism, I think there's a certain root of that in, uh, in, in Humboldt. And I said, I think part of this is, much of this is stripped out in the history of the origin, but I think some of it's coming back in, in the history of the descent, because one of the reasons that Darwin's going back and reusing notebooks C, M, and N to, in other words, craft the argument of the descent uh, uh, later. And he's, uh, and I think that, that some of those romantic points come in, but there are other people. I mean, I, I cited the one statement from Carus, he has a very interesting comments in C notebook on Carl Gustav Carus and the unity of nature and mind and so forth, which is one of the things I would agree. And so I take Bob's, if I had to take sides, I think generally Bob and I are more on, on the same side. So time for one more question, if um, such exists. Let's see, uh-huh. Uh, shall I read? Long. Can you so? But I think it needs to be read out. I believe, even though Phil Sloan can see it, doesn't it need to yeah. be read out? Yeah, read it's it. Read it out. Okay. So another Philip, another very learned Philip Honenberger, writes: Hi, Philip. I tend to think the influence of Lyell on Darwin as a kind of methodological exemplar is often underrated. Lyell is concerned to explain histories and explain historically but also appeals to a single common set of laws and forces. Could you say how Lyell fits in your narrative? Is Lyell a Newtonian or non-Newtonian and in what ways? Lyell also famously rejected Lamarck, both on evolution and internal vital forces. Is Darwin occupying a middle position between Lyell and Lamarck throughout this early period? Or does he basically turn his back on Lamarck early on and follow a fairly thoroughly Lyellian path, my inclination of interpretation? Uh, Philip, that's a very good, uh, good, good question. And I didn't mention Lyle uh, virtually in the whole paper, just for part of it for a matter of time. I think you're quite right that Lyle is a very important influence on Darwin. And I would also say that Lyle is certainly does have many dimensions. And, and I think you could say in with certain kind of qualification, he is a Newtonian. He's seeking for general law. He's actually seeking for uh, uniform actions of laws in history. It's one of the reasons why Lyle is an anti-progressionist, uh, which is one of the points where he will separate from, uh, from Darwin. He also, uh, he also rejects uh, the, these kind of appeals to, uh, to uh, particularly with Lamarck, to internal uh, vital powers in the way he, which he seems Lamarck uh, doing this. And I think that, uh, but I, uh, I think, it, you know, I think we'd have to explore a little bit more to what extent does Lyle play uh, a move in Darwin to what I would call the Newtonian turn. I think that one is not completely clear to me from the documents that Lyle is, is immediately important in that. It's one of the things to note that in with Lyle that Darwin's annotations on Lyle's principles of the crucial part is on the fifth edition, which he gets after he returns from the Beagle. And that is the one which has some interesting annotations 
that you could, in fact, follow up. But I would agree. I mean, I don't emphasize Lyle as much as, say, someone like uh, Jonathan Hodge would do. But nonetheless, I do think Lyle is certainly a very important point. And it is, if more time would be allowed, I would have tried to develop that point more. Well, it's going to be time for Philippe Ullmann's talk. So thanks to Phil Sloan again and to everyone for their questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you both. So now we will have Philippe Hunman's talk. Philippe Hunman is Director of Research at the Institut d'Histoire et de la Philosophie des Sciences et des Techniques at Paris 1 Sorbonne. After having studied the constitution of the concept of the organism in modern biology in relation with Kant, he turned to the philosophy of evolutionary biology and ecology. Some edited books include from Groups to Individuals, Functions, a co-edited Handbook of Evolutionary Thinking in the Sciences, as well as Challenging the Modern Synthesis. He has written on the relationships between natural selection and causation, on the roles of the organism in evolution, and on the con uh, computational conception of emergence in general. In 2021, through Stanford University Press, he will publish Why, and he will also publish a book in the same year on the philosophy of biological death. Thank you for uh, the invitation to this nice conference. It's a pleasure to be part of the scholars who will be um, celebrating the works of David Depew, who has been inspirational for all of us. Uh, so, In this talk, um, I'll uh, talk about something that David has been studied through many perspectives throughout his career, nam namely uh, the modern synthesis in evolutionary biology. And uh, uh, it's possible, uh, possible extension or expansion or overcoming by uh, novel theoretical frameworks. Uh, I'm inspired by, by uh, the, the, the method and the uh, general uh, attitude of uh, the important book Darwinism Evolving, he published with uh, Bruce Weber in 1994, where he uh, characterizes Darwinism as a research tradition which goes from Darwin and uh, goes on through uh, neo-Darwinism and the modern synthesis and many uh, achievements uh, later on. And um, there are several important claims in this book, and one of them is that a research tradition can evolve uh, by changing its ontologies. So it will be the same tradition, however, uh, researchers will uh, either uh, add a new ontology or shift ontology. And I think uh, that will be the heart of this presentation about uh, what, how many syntheses and, uh, exist as frameworks uh, in evolutionary biology. So um, in this book, uh, they say during most of the 20th century, the Darwinian tradition has gone under the name of the modern evolutionary synthesis, which married Darwin's theory of natural selection to the new science of genetics. Under the influence of our rapidly expanding knowledge of molecular biology, however, the modern synthesis has been subjected in recent decades to pressures and puzzlements that have led some to proclaim once again that Darwinism is on its deathbed, or at least is due for major, major surgery. To anyone who is familiar with the history of Darwinism, this can seem like, just like deja vu all over again. Here is where they are going in this book and most of the guessing comes in. We think there is reason to believe that the pressure is currently being put on the Darwinian tradition and on the theory of natural selection in particular may serve as an occasion for it to transform its life itself once again into an even po more powerful explanatory theory. So this claim and this argument are the horizon of this talk and uh, one can notice that this is uh, published in 1994 and there is uh, already an impression of déjà vu when people are claiming that Darwinism is on this bed. And uh, in the 2014, 15 and so on, there had been a sort of this new claim that Darwinism is on this bed and we have a new framework. And uh, it seems that it's the déjà vu of the déjà vu. 
so two papers by David are the motivation uh, of this talk. The first one is the paper about adaptation as a process, the future of Darwinism and the, the legacy of Theodor Wuth Dobzhansky, uh, a paper that uh, basically consider that there are two trends in the modern synthesis, one rather American and one rather British, and uh, examines examine the trajectory of the Francis thinking under this perspective. And the other one is a paper about uh, the, the four stocks, so namely uh, the forces of selection or the factors of selection or the, the causes of selection, the four stock in evolutionary biology. So, uh, I think those, those papers are really uh, important because uh, they help us to, uh, through genealogy and through conceptual genealogy and through linguistic analysis, to eliminate or to decide two controversies, uh, one about adaptationism and the other one about uh, what's called the statisticalist view of natural selection. And uh, this will be uh, considered later on in my talk. So. Um, there are many approaches to the modern synthesis um, in evolutionary biology, and two sets of questions uh, can be, uh, can be uh, a way of understanding my question, how many synthesis. Uh, there is a synchronical question, which is, if you consider the classical modern synthesis, the one which defines evolutionary biology, uh, was it a theoretical, an institutional, a social event, uh, how many of uh, these meanings, social, theoretical, institutional, are uh, valid together? So those are the questions many historians of biology and philosophers have been dealing with, including David Depew. And um, I'll uh, try to have a new look on them. And then there is the diachronical question. So uh, there has been a modern synthesis, that's one, at least one synthesis, and now there are people arguing that we should have an extended synthesis Others are going for an expanded synthesis or an including synthesis, and so on. So actually, there are several syntheses of evolutionary uh, biology, biology on the market, and there are competing syntheses. And the question, uh, the, the, the preliminary question is, are they different? How many of them are actually uh, in the game, and so on? So those will be the, the, the major question of the talk. I'll start by considering the modern synthesis as a social event. Uh, then the modern synthesis are rather as a theory. Uh, then I'll look at uh, all those questions at the final grain with the help of uh, David's paper on Forstock. And finally, I'll address the question of whether there is a novel synthesis that is, that is going on now, that has been going on since like 10 or 15 years. Um, so first, considering the modern synthesis as a social event, uh, actually, uh, historians of biology since uh, the, 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 the 80s and have been questioning whether uh, the modern synthesis, namely basically the synthesis of Darwin's view of natural evolution by natural selection and Mendelian genetics, is uh, really a theory or, or, or what it is, because uh, it's, we agreed on the fact that it started with population biology and then uh, Maria Simpson, Dobchansky, Wrench, and a bunch of other people built on evo uh, population genetics to uh, produce a framework that was able to uh, formulate many questions uh, about evolution, adaptation, and uh, diversity. Uh, but uh, it's hard to find out one single or a set of claims that would be uh, the core of the theory. And that's why several uh, philosophers and historians have uh, concluded that uh, the modern synthesis is rather an institutional or social fact than a, a theory or paradigm. So the fact is that after the modern synthesis, evolutionary biology becomes a discipline, a discipline with all the sociological markers of chairs, journals like evolution, um, conferences, and a set of uh, problems that could be addressed in curricula for students. And um, with the modern synthesis, uh, the, the, the biologists, evolutionary biologists, uh, had a way to uh, be uh, a real scientific discipline and not uh, 
just uh, fossil collectors or um, something that has been more and more depreciated with the advent of um, formalized theories and experimental biology. So there are many papers by Joe Kane on this and uh, the distinction made by Bruno Strasser uh, between the naturalist and the experimental traditions is also relevant here. And it's the modern synthesis can be understood as a way to uh, depart from the naturalist tradition, which was Darwin's tradition, and uh, to uh, acquire the uh, external uh, symptoms of scientificity that makes uh, um, uh, knowledge into an academic discipline. And interestingly, in a paper uh, from, from 1986, quite questioning the modern synthesis, John Beatty uh, asked uh, wh what happens between the population genetics, which is a core theory and, uh, uh, of, of, of which they, the, the coordinates and the major uh, books and authors can be identified, identified and, uh, and the modern synthesis properly. And uh, um, Deep Q writes, the core of the modern synthesis is actually uh, pretty much just the theory of population genetics. So the modern synthesis is not happening at a theoretical level. Um, but there is more to the synthesis than theory, he says. And uh, like the few later, he centers are on Dobzhansky and she says that, for example, Dobzhansky's use of recurrent concepts in field observations and lab experiments was a contribution of another nature. It was not evidence for claims, but rather it was making explicit the fact that models and theories could indeed be used to handle real data. So um, it's uh, very um, plausible that the modern synthesis is not happening on the theoretical level uh, primarily. Um, and that explains why there is no major common explicit theoretical claim shared by all the founders of the synthesis, uh, but rather uh, there exist a posteriori, a posteriori reconstructions of the event during its happening. So uh, what's uh, very uh, distinctive of the modern synthesis is that, is that while it's happening, biologists are also commenting the fact of it's happening and are vindicating the fact that they are doing something new by synthesizing various knowledges at both experimental and, and uh, theoretical level. So the modern synthesis was, while it uh, was in, pro in progress, a self-conscious field, and this self-consciousness can be uh, can, can be uh, identified by considering two benchmarks. First, the book by Huxley, Evolution, the Modern Synthesis, which gave the synthesis its name. And uh, second, the uh, collection of articles based on the conference gathered by, uh, collected by Hans Mayer and Bill Provine in 1980 called The Evolutionary Synthesis, where many of the architects of the synthesis and some later biologists reflect on what the synthesis was. Uh, but this reflection is also uh, producing the sort of received view of what uh, the modern synthesis should be. And this received view is uh, much, um, it's much impacted by Hans Mayer's own view of the synthesis. So um, if you will look at Huxley, Huxley's uh, 1942 book, at some point, he says, the time is ripe for rapid advance in our understanding of evolution, genetics, genetics development, ecology, developmental physiology, ecology, systematics, paleontology, cytology, mathematical analysis, have all provided new facts or new tools of research. The need today is for a concerted attack and synthesis. If this book contributes to such a synthetic point of view, I shall be well content. So Huxley's book was not only providing the name of the modern synthesis, but also a program which is an expansion from the basics of um, population genetics and quantitative genetics towards uh, many fields related to uh, the biology of evolution. So uh, I, I was very happy to work with, uh, with David and uh, with other, other scholars, especially uh, uh, the late uh, Jean Gaillon, on uh, a long-term project which uh, resulted in a special issue of the Journal of the History of Biology in 2019 that was, um, that was uh, trying to 
tackle the question of what the modern synthesis was by uh, by considering each of the lines of attack that Huxley in this uh, in the, in these um, sentences was um, considering as the program for the synthesis to come. So, uh, and I think that's where I also uh, benefited a lot from David's uh, impressive uh, knowledge and uh, understanding of what was going on with the synthesis. So uh, now if we consider, uh, if, if we still consider the modern synthesis as a theory, uh, I think that there is uh, something very uh, important that is uh, argued in David Depew's 2011 paper on the fourth paper. So I'm reading uh, from the paper, so the Chomsky's views of adaptation as dynamical process contrasts with so-called adaptationist views of natural selection figured as design without a designer or relatively discrete enum enumerable adaptations. Correlated with these respectively process and product oriented approaches to adaptive natural selection are divergent pictures of organisms themselves as developmental poles or as bundles of adaptations. So uh, on the from the viewpoint of theory, the modern, the modern synthesis is not one theory, says uh, David Dupieux. Uh, the modern synthesis is rather uh, at least two theories, one which is uh, oriented towards the process of adaptation, and it's rather Dobchansky, and uh, the other one which is oriented towards uh, adaptation as a product, so the idea of uh, design without a designer, which is, and I'll uh, get to it later, uh, which is uh, the view that started by uh, with Ronald, Ronald Fisher and was uh, influential in the British School of Evolutionary Biology. So um, if one wants to look at what could be a core theoretical commitment of all synthesists, there is this sentence uh, that Huxley wrote in a letter to Maria when they were preparing, preparing a collective book commemorating the origin of species. Natural selection, he says, uh, acting on the heritable variations provided by the mutations and recombination of Mendelian genetic constitution is the main agency of biological evolution. So there are two pillars of the modern synthesis, natural selection as an agent, and uh, uh, the Mendelian genetic constitution of a population which, in which variations are given by mutations and recombinations. Uh, so it might be that this is the core of the theory, but uh, it's a very thin theoretical core. And what David Debu tells us is that there are two ways, at least two ways of understanding these core commitments, depending on how you think of natural selection producing adaptation. And um, so what in, in the 2011 paper, David Debu says uh, there are two ways of understanding adaptation either as a product so you will one looks at a trait understood as a result of natural selection and one asks what was the selective pressure pressures responsible of this trait and uh, as a process which uh, try to fo focuses rather on the developmental and ecological underpinnings of uh, natural selection. And uh, the other distinction uh, David Dupieux makes is uh, whether organisms are viewed as bundles of adaptations, and that's a, that's a phrase by Huxley, or as uh, developmental holes. And of course, uh, this, uh, this distinction and uh, the perspective taken by the Chomsky, uh, according to David Dupieux, Namely, see, namely seeing organisms as developmental poles and adaptation as a process predates Gould and Lewontin's famous critique of adaptationism because basically what uh, Gould and Lewontin in their Spandrel's paper were saying was that uh, organisms are not bundles of adaptations and one should not try to understand organisms as just a set of products of natural selection. So uh, one can replace easily Golden Lewontin's in the filiation paper, in the filiation of this uh, second kind of synthesis that is uh, inspired by, the, that is represented by Dobchansky, or uh, still according to David Dupieux. Um, so those two synthesis are uh, 
geographically located. So if one think in terms of biologists, uh, the, uh, the first synthesis, which, which uh, focuses on adaptation as product and organisms as bundles adaptation, is rather the fisherian tradition in the, in the UK. So uh, it's Fisher, it's Ford, and it's his ecological genetics, Dawkins uh, dogmatically, and uh, more generally, many inspirations of the behavioral ecology, including Maynard Smith's work. And more lately, uh, Alan Grafen's formal Darwinism that continues uh, Fisher's understanding of natural selection as a uh, design without a designer. Um, the other kind of synthesis is more uh, to be found in the US and uh, uh, it's inspired by uh, the school of Wright and Dobchansky and then Simpson Mayer, Lewontin Gould uh, would be, uh, would represent this, uh, the, 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 this other synthesis. And uh, interestingly, uh, if one looks at those two traditions, uh, the, 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 the feeling of déjà vu that someone may have by uh, looking at the claims that Darwinism is dead uh, could be understood as um, another uh, realization that the, the modern synthesis started as a divided uh, field. So, of course, there is the potential for critic because there are at least two synthesis. And uh, if one wants to character, characterize those two synthesis further, uh, in terms of explanations, the, the, what, what's the core, what's the, uh, the key of, the, what's crucial, sorry, in the division is uh, the status of selectionism. So uh, is select natural selection the main explanations and how it is, how is it the main explanations? To what extent one should understand it in genetic term or in ecological terms, for example. Uh, from the viewpoint of explananda, uh, the UK brand of synthesis is more targeting adaptation, whereas the other uh, US brand of the synthesis might be more uh, receptive to the question of diversity. Um, the UK brand, for example, is more receptive to the question of complexity. Uh, for instance, Dawkins sees evolutionary biology as a science mainly of complex adaptations. Uh, while the U.S. brand is more uh, interested in uh, like diversity in general and its many patterns. Uh, and finally, one key explanation is in the U.K. brand of the uh, modern synthesis would be the traits, the traits of an organism, where a speciation might be one of the key questions for all the U.S. brand of uh, modern synthesis. So... Um, the consequence of that is that the adaptationism debate started by Gould and Lewontin uh, is deflated. There is not one issue of adaptationism and one decision to be made about it, but there are many problem agendas, even many ontologies, depending on what are the major explananda. And uh, of course, uh, this supposes that one research tradition can, in one research tradition, several distinct ontologies can be included, and that was one of the claim of the book Darwinism Evolving. Um, a test case of this uh, view of the two synthesis is given by ecology. So if one looks at ecology, whose relation with evolution has been always complicated since uh, the, 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 the 30s, uh, there are two, uh, at least two threads. The one starts with uh, Ford, who was a, a, a student of Fisher and who wrote uh, the, the book Ecological Genetics in 19, 1964, which was relying on many of his papers and the works of his students. And uh, uh, in Ford Ecological Genetics, ecology is mostly testing natural selection in the field and trying to corroborate selectionism mostly against right. Ford and Fisher in their paper show that in the, in the field there are even more selection than drift that, that, than, uh, selection, that, than theory would predict. Whereas um, in the US, a uh, monument of animal ecology was the book, The Principles of Animal Ecology, written by uh, Clyde Daly, Alfred Emerson, Thomas Park, all on the park, and uh, Carl Schmidt in, published in 1949. And in this book, uh, that was this book was 
much uh, influenced by Wright and who was also in Chicago as many of the authors of this book, and, and Dobzhansky. And uh, in this book, ecology is an autom autonomous science and is based on a group selection as parallel to individual, individual selection. And uh, ecological communities correspond to organisms. So they uh, reinterpret uh, Clement's idea that there is a metabolism of an ecological community in Darwinian terms, in terms of group selection. And um, that's a very different kind of ecology uh, than the one that, that the one, uh, uh, sorry, di different from the one uh, done by Ford. And uh, Jebzhansky endorsed the project and he's reviewing the quarterly review of biology. He says no serious objection would be raised against this community as superorganisms idea. So um, if one looks at all uh, those questions at a finer gra grain, uh, one could even say they are, depending on the question uh, considered, there are several theories. So uh, David D. Pugh's, uh mostly focuses on the role of adaptation, and then there are two theories when one looks at the modern synthesis. Uh, John Beattie and uh, other philosophers have however, argued that the creativity of natural selection is a unifying theme even between those two theories. So natural selection for the, 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 the synthesis is not just a theme, it also contributes to shaping traits of individuals, especially on several generations, natural selection changes the probabilities of various genotypes by acting on the frequencies of alleles. So the variation is in principle independent of selection and adaptation at what generation? But selection in several generations impacts variation. And that's why selection is creative. So that would be a way to argue that there is a, one synthesis that has been divided into a UK and a US brand. However, one could also look at the viewpoint of scales and the relation between macro and micro evolution and the status of speciation. And here, uh, there would be two theories, one made of extrapolationists, so like Simpson and Evgency for for whom mac macroevolution does not require other princesses than microevolution. It's an extrapolation of microevolution. Whereas some discontinuists uh, would uh, argue that macroevolution is not derivable from microevolution. And it's famous to what Gould was saying. But interestingly, that was also the point of several Russian biologists, including Filipchenko, of whom Dipchensky was a student. So, but if now, now I, I will argue that uh, between my two questions, so between the, uh, the, the, the theory and the modern synthesis as theory and modern synthesis as social fact, there is something that is very important. This is the, the language and the rhetorics. And I think uh, one of the strengths of David Dipu's work is to, to, to show, uh, to, to, to make this point actually. So considering this other, paper, uh, Conceptual Change and the Rhetoric of Evolutionary Theory, Force Talk as a Case Study. It's a 2014 paper. Um, I think it's a very useful paper because it deflates an ontological controversy about uh, evolutionary theory that is familiar to many philosophers of biology now. So the question is, is natural selection a cause or a force, or is it a statistical construct? And this question has been famously um, raised by Dennis Walsh, Andrea Ryu, Mohan Mathen, and Tim Lewins. Uh, and it's what they call statisticalism. So the claim is that here, uh, natural selection is just the aggregated result of myriads of individual ecological interactions, not a cause acting on populations. And this is in straight contrast with the classical view of selection, which for philosophers have been given by Sober's Nature of Selection in 1984. Namely, that selection is one of the four forces acting on gene frequencies along mutation, migration, and drift. Or selection is a cause of evolution. And here, the, the concept of force includes the Newtonian analogy. So a force explains a departure from a state of inertia. The notion of cause uh, refers to either a process view of causation or a counterfactual view of causation. And the notion of factor would refer to um, equations are linear, reg um, linear regression, and uh, it involves, it is much less neutral in terms of ontology. And David Dipu's paper is precisely uh, paying attention to this notion, this term, the factor of evolution that is neglected by 
the sides of uh, the, both sides of the debate about statisticalism. And in his paper, Depew tells us that Darwin was talking about forces, and then uh, later on, uh, other biologists, including Halden, was talking about causes of evolution. That's the title of Halden's book. And in the 40s, uh, sorry, in the 50s, the modern synthesis started to talk about factors of evolution. And uh, they, uh, they, they, they gave up the interacting metaphors of force and design. And uh, David Dupuy says that, uh, that this is no accident that the classical text of the modern synthesis speak of natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, and gene flow as factors, processes, and agents, not as forces or mechanisms. But after the 60s, the force took uh, comes back through behavioral ecology because uh, it comes uh, with the need to talk about design. So when one looks at the context in which those terms are used, rather than abstractly in terms of uh, the, 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 the metaphysical opposition between causes and statistics, one has a better look at what was going on in the modern synthesis. There was strategic motivation for using the terms force, factor, and cause. And those terms had a role in the social process of making disciplines and then producing an academic identity for Darwinism at various stages of the synthesis. So the metaphysical dispute about statisticalism forgets that world choices have a history which reflects strategies in the social context. And more generally, the modern synthesis as a theory and the modern synthesis as a social event are connected via rhetorics whose evolution and splits transfer social processes and conflicts into the theoretical sphere. So that's why maybe the various synthesis may not be countable, uh, because the counting them at the theoretical and social level does not not make sense separately. So my last question was, are we witnessing a new synthesis? So a second or a third or a fourth one. Um, the argument for that now is that there would be a second synthesis uh, that would encompass new phenomena or, uh, or, or uh, phenomena overlooked by the modern synthesis. So inclusive inheritance, direct variation, and developmental constraint, niche construction, phenotypic plasticity, mass extinction, and so on. All those uh, new concepts uh, may call for a novel evolutionary synthesis that is argued for by many biologists, including for famously Kevin Leyland, uh, Gerd Müller, Massimo Pellucci, and others. Um, however, the modern synthesis has always worked by integrating things that seem very different. The best example is that in the 16th, King and Dukes uh, came up with what they called non-Darwinian evolution, uh, that was a chimera, chimera's neutral evolution. But now neutralism is a, a building brick of modern uh, the modern Darwinism or the modern modern synthesis, uh, which also integrated the phenotypic viewpoint of behavioral ecology that was actually quite uh, different from classical um, classical evolutionary thinking in the 60s. Um, so Darwinism evolve, evolving, uh, the, the book by the Pew and Weber says uh, that novel concepts are an occasion for the modern Darwinism to transform itself once again into an even more powerful explanatory theory. So there would be no disruption. And I think that this uh, view would still hold with uh, the claim for uh, a new synthesis. So what Darwinism evol evolving addresses is mostly the evo evo, evo challenge that was very powerful in the 19th, including the role of self-organizing theories and actually uh, Self-organization and natural selection are two ways of generating, uh, grossly speaking, order from randomness, and they are not formally similar. So there is a philosophical issue about how to art articulate them that underlies the relation between evo-devo and uh, classical uh, modern synthesis theory. So and leaving aside the question of idealism versus materialism, uh, that is uh, that is implicitly contained in, in this in this debate. But the the fact is that this novel synthesis, the one that we are witnessing now under various names, that is supposed to overcome the modern synthesis, is very heterogeneous. So um, 
I, I, I tried to build the explanatory, to, to draw the explanatory structure of the modern synthesis uh, on the right uh, bottom. And uh, the, as contrasted to the explanatory structure of the modern synthesis. And the modern synthesis is uh, strictly uh, centered on natural selection and adaptation. While if one quickly looks at the, those drawings, the alternative explanatory schemes, so um, the, the claims for a new synthesis, uh, it's much more complex and not uh, centered on one concept. And there are plasticity, niche construction, development and constraints. All of them play a role uh, in, uh, in the explanation of the major explanation now of evolutionary biology, namely adaptation, diversity, and the unity of cross diversity. So, is uh, the new synthesis really novel? There are many candidates, and that's a lot of them, besides PUC and Miller's extended synthesis, for example, uh, for Doolittle, uh, It's Not Theory, uh, Etienne Darchin's inclusive synthesis, or uh, Hodgson, Hodgson and Knudsen universal Darwinism. Um, so, quickly said, well, I think there is uh, a major grain issue to which David Depew is very uh, sensitive here. So at a fine grain, something can seem novel. For example, at a finer grain, epigenetics is very novel because it's about the regulating expression of genomes and it requests some findings in molecular biology and genomics to be a field of uh, investigation. Whereas at a coarse grain, there is a long history of the concept of soft inheritance and epigenetics uh, is a part of it, actually. And in the same way, niche construction uh, on a finer grain uh, started with indication by Dick Lewontin and the incorporation of those indications by Odling Smee, Leyland, and Feldman in their 2003 book on the neglected process in evolution. And they were relying on uh, the idea of engin ecosystem engineering developed at the same time by ecologists. However, on the coarser grain, if one looks at, for example, Elton, Elton animal ecology and evolution, Elton already said that in evolution there exist two processes, uh, the one which is the selection of the environment by the animal and the one uh, which is the natural of selection of the animal by the env environment and those two directions parallel, the two directions of niche construction on the one hand and natural selection on the other hand according to Olingsmi and his co-authors. So there is a long-term story, history of the notion of niche construction. Um, at the, at the course grain of history. So now if one looks at the social dimension of those uh, series, of those new claims for, of the, sorry, those claims and uh, vindication for a novel synthesis, uh, there is still a, a gradient between uh, how much it is a theory and how much it is a social fact. And uh, I think the question, why is the extended synthesis, so the ones developed in the 2002 books and mostly advocated by Leyland and Nixley, Le sorry, Leyland, uh, Muller, and Pigushi, uh, has uh, superseded all alternatives because in many confer major conferences and, uh, and papers now, when people talk about uh, a new synthesis, they are mostly talking about this version of an alternative to the modern synthesis. And I think the question why this extended synthesis that is now a label has superseded all alternatives should be formulated in this gradient, the gradient that goes from theory to social facts. And um, there are many strategical uh, factors here. For example, they would explain why the niche construction uh, series, the links me and Leyland, or the multi-level selection series, David Stone, and finally joined this version of an alternative to the modern synthesis. Uh, and I think what David, David teaches us is that strategies and social forces plays always a major role, and even in the shaping of what will be uh, the, the, the accepted series. And that, that's also a lesson of the Fausto paper, and for example, what here could look at the major role of funding agencies in the uh, elaboration of those alternatives to uh, the modern synthesis and the competition between various alternatives to the modern synthesis during the last two decades. So as a conclusion, I think that, uh, well, I wanted to show uh, in this talk the, the as a, an example of what David Depew's work is showing us 
I wanted to, 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 to give an example of the fruitfulness of an integrated reading that joins discourse, rhetoric, rhetorical analysis, conceptual analysis, and history. And um, uh, show with David Dipu that the notion of rhetorics and the strategy bridge the theory, the theoretical aspect and the social institutional aspect. When one talk about, talks about the modern synthesis, they bridge internalism and externalism in history and philosophy of science. And um, this allows a better understanding not only of the modern synthesis, but of what happens now of Darwinism evolving. Thank you. And well, I'm going to turn over, sorry, a bit of a delay. I'm going to turn over the Q&A session to Betty and uh, go ahead when you yeah. have a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. So are there any questions from audience members? You can just use the chat function or the Q&A. I think the Q&A is what we're using. I have lots, but I'm hoping that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping. I'm hoping. So, so, Betty, in the interim, because we only have five minutes. So, oh. Betty, in the interim, I think it would be really great because your, your presentation intersects so much with what Philippe is saying. Uh, and also, there's some differences in approaches. I can certainly say, see that, you know, if you could give a, a short comment and then we can get people. Give well, people have, time for some questions. Yeah. I have, I, first of all, I have a question. I find it really interesting that um, Philippe, as uh, the closest colleague to Jean Gaillon, um, and I think we should mention Jean because he, um, you know, he's a he's a real he has been a real force in um, especially 20th century, even late 19th century. That book of his, Darwin and After Darwin, is so important. And what I got out of it especially that I thought was novel, was all the work that has been done um, by French uh, theoretical population geneticists. So I find it interesting that you are talking um, about the English versus um, the Americans, but you didn't mention the French theoretical population genetic school. Is there a French equivalent to the UK and to America? Well, I think, uh, first of all, there is a question of, let's say, of period, periodization. So, well, first of all, actually, I was relying on David's paper on uh, Dubchansky, and I think I, I was uh, uh, extracting from this paper this idea that you have two dominant threads in the, in the, in the synthesis, so the, the more, more uh, American one and the more British one, and what's interesting here, is that they are here from the beginning because it's basically right and Fisher. Uh, even though, of course, the geography is not perfect because Williams would be rather, you know, like he, and actually he started by reacting against Emerson, who was uh, like a key figure of the Chicago School of Ecology. So, but then there is this issue of like coarse grain or fine grain. So if you want to zoom zoom in, you'll find out that there will be a German or a Russian, that, that, that's absolutely very important, or a, a, a French school of, but, but I think what, what David is, uh, is uh, looking at is not exactly the, 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 what sociologists would call a school, because uh, it intersects with a school in terms of sociology, namely uh, some people working together and uh, having institutions, chair journals, and so on. But it's also more uh, precisely more theoretical, and it can be shared by people who are not so sociologically in this uh, putative school. So, and that's why Williams could be more uh, sort of um, more like Maynard, Maynard Smith, like a British inspired synthesis than an American inspired synthesis. Uh, and so at a finer grain, you would find also schools in terms of sociology and schools in terms of what uh, David identifies as the brands of the synthesis. However, the schools would be more, um, they would not be, he be here from the beginning. And so that's why the French school is massively represented around, uh, was started with Lerite and Tessier. And their work is, uh, um, 
I, I think it's very interesting because the first there is Maliko, but Maliko had his effect very late. Well, maybe through people like um, Wright, but uh, his deepest effect started in the 70s or the 80s. So it started with the new population genetics, neutralism, and so on. And Maliko was a, a sort of free rider because, and he was not very much integrated. He was not really speaking, uh, he was not writing in English. But then the, 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 the French school as integrated within the synthesis would start would be starting in the like 50s or 60s with Larry T and Tessier. And then it had first uh, an identity that was relying on, on the flies, I mean, on, 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 um, on, on the, the, the cages, the, the cages used by uh, Tessier to, to work on, on, on um, Drosophila and to make experimental evolutionary biology. Uh, and uh, and I think in terms of proximity, it would it would be rather uh, more cl rather closer to the American brand of more interdiversity diversity than in adaptation. For example, polymorphism was the key question for those people. Evolution of pol polymorphism, the the classic versus balanced debate, and um, and then it had also to face the internal uh, resistances in terms of the French academia in biology that was dominated by Isola Lamarckian or people more interested in physiology than, uh, well, more interested in one, what Ansmar would call proximate causes physiology than, than genetics or evolution. And um, so uh, there was definitively a French tradition in the modern synthesis, especially in sociological terms, I'm not sure that there was uh, there, or that there is a tradition. Uh, there is a brand of the synthesis that could be as massive as the UK brand and the US brand as they have been, I think, identified in in David's paper and David works. I don't know if that 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 is a uh, so, uh, uh, but that's the answer. The short answer. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Do we have, um, I don't, I think we've run out of time, but we have, can I just suggest perhaps that um, Philip, Benjamin and um, Kimler, my favorite, my favorite historian of biology here. Um, and Bill, could you hold on to your questions because they will come up again after um, I give my talk. Do we have time to respond to these? I think if uh, we certainly have a little bit of time to respond to these questions in a brief way, we're cutting a little bit into the break. So I'm going to have to okay. cut everyone off after, after go, five minutes or so. Let's go to uh, Philip, um, Philip's question. Um, can you tell the story of the synthesis as one of selectionist versus pluralist? It seems in mid mid period synthesis, the most notable phenomenon is the gatekeeping of people like Meyer and Simpson about what is and isn't kosher in evolutionary theory. And the critique of the adaptationism and extended synthesis were about saying, yes, natural selection is important, but there are other factors that are important too. And Wright is clearly a predecessor of the pluralist while Fisher is a predecessor of the selectionist. What would be missing by telling the story this way? Did you follow that, Philip? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think this is the classical way of you know, uh, looking at the debate and especially in terms of Fisher versus Wright. And uh, I was interested in David's paper because I think it, it gives another take on the story. It allows one to, um, I think it allows one to, to, to think in terms of what were their takes on the organism. And I think that that's very important. Uh, it also uh, allows one to look at the, um, uh, as I was doing, I think it's, it's very inspirational uh, for someone who wants to understand the various emergences of traditions in community ecology and, this, uh, and in ecology at this time and the relation between evolutionary biology and ecology. And uh, so, uh, and, and also it, it allows one to connect the, um, uh, the theory and uh, the purely, theor purely theoretical view of uh, biology. So is it selection or should we be pluralist 
it connects this theoretical perspective to precisely the sociological perspective. I mean, the UK and the US. And uh, I mean, of course, we know that, you know, Fisher versus Wright, it's like the purely selectionist versus the, the more pluralist and the more, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the more, um, uh, the less adaptationist uh, views. But, but this left, this leaves the sociology out of the picture. And I think that one of the forces of David's approach is that it, it allows us to connect the sociological processes and uh, the purely theoretical level. And that, that, that was the, 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 um, uh, the center of my talk. And last, um, it also, uh, in terms of explananda, I think it's quite illuminative to, 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 to show that uh, not only uh, the two traditions are not uh, agreeing on what's the explanatory. So is it only selection or mostly selection or is it like lots of things, and and I'm I am perfectly okay with with the story. I mean that's right. But it's also about the explanation that what's worth being explained. And for example, Dawkins. I mean, it's to to understand the debates about about Dawkins. I mean, Dawkins thinks that what should be explained is complex adaptations, and actually, it's a very um, isolated position uh among the, the the very rich uh history and cartography of the modern synthesis and it can be explained uh, uh by locating dawkins in this uh uk tradition okay one um benjamin feldman wants to know do you have any thoughts on whether the theory of facilitated variation as expressed in the plausibility of life by gerhardt and kirschner might be considered a new synthesis? Well, actually, uh, the, the, the very question, I mean, you know, it, it can be or it cannot be. I, I think that the question uh, in which I'm more, more interested is that uh, I listed some of the uh, putative new synthesis, and Gerhardt and Kirchner are obviously, I mean, facilitated variation is obviously another uh, synthesis because it's, it indicates a mechanism that can be seen as novel, facilitated variation. And uh, it has also uh, a sort of um, uh, wide theoretical ambition. So some people are, would be, uh, are focusing on one maybe new mechanism uh, or one overlooked mechanism, but they are not trying to, to design a new understanding of evolution. But the point is that uh, Gerhardt and Kirchner is possibly a new synthesis. And there are many of them actually in the market, more than maybe when David and Weber were writing Darwinism evolving in the late nineties. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, you know, uh, is there one that is winning, one that is uh, superseding the others and it's possible. And, and, the, and, and the, reason, the, the reason why is interesting. The other question is how do they all connect? So how do, uh, how does facilitated variation connect with directed variation with, uh, uh, let's for example, Armin Stolfus' uh, series of uh, mutations as directing evolution or with a um, uh, series of evolvability uh, that are also about exploring the phenotype genotype maps. And, and, and that, for me, that's a more interesting question. I think the question is X novel or not is always related to your grain of description, you know, right? and the, and to some extent, I, I, I maybe the, the most uh, convincing answers are sociological. So, but, but yeah, that, that would be my answer. One final, really quick question. Um, Bill Kimmler wants to know um, if uh, he thinks that there's a parallel historiography about this with the scientific revolution. And he says, um, recent work there has emphasized not was created as unity, but what was lost. Is there a parallel way of seeing the synthesis as removal or rejection of older concepts, a core unity over what was no longer legitimate? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, the, the, for example, Gould's famous paper on hardening the synthesis is about how the synthesis has been rejecting more and more concepts. But start, starting with the the, 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 the um, synthesis, the classical synthesis, they uh, got rid of uh, the, the directed uh, variation or autogenesis. I mean, they got rid of many things that were uh, 
legitimately explanatory for Darwin and his immediate successors, including Weissmann, for example. And, uh, and in this sense, I think they, they, what would be for me the most interesting would be to compare with the Russians, because the Russian school of all those people, the Chansky, Timofeyev, Krasovsky, and all Hirschmachhausen and all others, uh, uh, had lots of uh, explanation processes, causes. And for example, Dobchensky uh, did his uh, contribution to the, to the synthesis also as a discussion with his masters, especially Fivchenko. And uh, so people who are not gradualists, who would admit other revolutionary causes and so on. So, uh, uh, so I, I have, I'm absolutely, absolutely um, in agreement with this, uh, with this, um, uh, with this perspective. I was reading William Kimler's question right now about uh, David Wooten, the invention of science. Yeah, thank you for the references. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know those ones. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you to the audience members. And we've gone over time, but it was the break, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you for, for your patience and the attention. And thank you. Thanks a lot, David, for being so inspirational and friendly. And uh, Chris for having uh, organized this event. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely, Philippe. And thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I will have to say just as a comment that I'm a little worried in terms of the discussion of the synthesis. At what point does it become so broad and so complex that it loses explanatory force? And this is for any definition of, say, generalized Darwinism, and we can talk about this more. So there is a, a 45 minute or so break, and we are reconvening at two o'clock with Charles Wolf's talk. Um, and we hope to see you then. And thank you very much. Uh, for your participation. Thank you very much, Philippe. That was wonderful. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yep.